folks, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell, and we have a lot of cool stuff for you today. But before we jump into that, a couple things. Next week, there will be no Board Game Breakfast. Uh, I like to keep the Dice Tower running on a regular basis throughout the year, but every once in a while we need to take a week off, and next week is the Dice Tower Convention, and so I think that's a good time to do it. There won't be anything next week. No board game breakfast, no reviews, nothing. Um, so hopefully you enjoy this week, and if you just give us a chance to take a break, I think we've produced enough videos for you to go back and watch some stuff that you've missed. That being said, we're here with Board Game Breakfast. Let's get to the news. There's been a lot of interesting releases that Asmodee announced in their newsletter, and if you looked at the Origins previews, I mean, Asmodee has a ton of stuff, but there's a couple things that caught my eye. One is Neil Borns. Remember that old game where you had the flat tires, unless you had the impenetrable tires? A great card, little card game. Uh, I, I, I probably wouldn't play it much these days. I did like it a lot as a kid. Um, and another game that I liked as a kid, Hotel Tycoon. I wonder if they're changing this at all. If you've never played this, it's kind of like Monopoly, but there was big three-dimensional hotels that you went around. And Terror in Meeple City. What is that, you say? Well, that's the renaming of Rampage. Apparently, there's some legal problems with the name Rampage, so they decided to name it Terror in Meeple City. It seems like a dumb name to me, but I don't know. Uh, WizKids has announced a new program called Con in Your Store, where they're, if you buy products from them, they'll send you a box full of stuff to run your own little mini convention to get the exclusives and things in your store. So you don't have to go to a convention to get the cool WizKids stuff, and you can get it at your local gaming store. Gale Force 9 has announced a new expansion for um, their Firefly game, the Blue Sun expansion. This is a big expansion. The last two were small ones. This will have a new board with new locations and new captains and new ships. That should make a lot of people very happy. Days of Wonders officially announced five tribes. Now, they've actually released information about this. This is unusual. And this is one of the heaviest games that they've produced thus far. Of course, having the gorgeous amount of components that Days of Wonder is known for. They'll have a few of them at Gen Con. Uh, Cranial Creations has this game called Soquandro. I'm not trying to pronounce it. I just thought it caught my eye because you're rolling dice in this game, but you're also running around the house looking for things. Doesn't sound dangerous at all. And let's see, uh, Fantasy Flight has released some more information about Foul Play, their upcoming expansion for the Blood Bowl Team Manager. Uh, we have the three new teams, Nurgle's Rotters, Czar Nagran Ziggurats, and the Lowdown Rats. Now, the Lowdown Rats, uh, I've always liked the, the rat folk from Warhammer, and these guys look like they get convened and break the rules in the game a lot to their own uh, methods, and I, I like that a lot. So that's the regular new... The biggest release last week was the Ticket to Ride Deluxe Edition. Lots of people getting a hold of those, and I'm sure we'll see those showing up all over the place. Cool Stuff has a discount on it, $70, and yet they're still selling. So obviously people want a Deluxe Ticket to Ride. Also, Ascension Realms Unraveled. I think that's a very fun expansion for Ascension. Chaos Ball. Very cool game. A lot of good stuff was released. New dice for Battle Lore. Crash Games had a whole pile of stuff that was put on uh, the Cool Stuff website. The best game that they've done is Council of Verona. And some more planes for Wings of Glory. I don't know much that's coming out this coming week. Actually, I apologize for that. I think we're going to see a fewer releases now as we get closer to Gen Con, and then you'll see a whole pile at one time. Uh, but the pet new Pathfinder deck number six we'll see this week, and maybe some more things after that. All right, where are we going next? Ah, to the professor. Hi there, everyone. This is Scott Nicholson. Welcome to the Ivory Dice Tower. This is one academic's look at some aspects of this world of board games. Now, um, G, who is a scholar that looks at learning games, talks about the concept of goals and roles when developing a learning game. Goals and roles means that in order to actually create a good learning game, you need to think about two things. What are the learning goals that you want the players to have? And what are the roles that the players can take on such that they can explore those goals? And when you have both of those things, when you have goals and you have roles, they come together and it can make a really nice learning game experience. If you don't have roles that make sense for the learning outcomes, there's a disconnect. If you have roles that make sense, but you don't have goals that connect you to learning outcomes, then you're just doing an activity. So what you're really looking for is that match of goals and roles. And I think about some of our board games, and it's dawned on me that what I seek in board games today, what makes me happy is a game where the role I am playing fits with the activities that I'm doing in the game. 
So I find when there's a disconnect between I'm playing this role and I'm doing these activities, then I get frustrated with the game, or the game needs to be relatively short. Um, a good example of a game that matches goals and roles well is Steam Park. In Steam Park, you know, you're playing the role of designing this theme park, and you are using the dice in order to assign, you build rides and get different sorts of things and balance cleaning and balance all this other stuff. And it feels like you're dealing with all the hassles of running this, this theme park. And so the roles and the goals mesh quite well. Glass Road, on the other hand, um, if you think about, if you've played this game, you know that you're doing things like terraforming and then having workers dig sand and having these bizarre wheels move that trigger, I don't know. And so there's a disconnect between the goals and the roles. Now, I'm okay with this game because it ends relatively quickly, 30 to 40 minutes, and I'm okay with that. But I do find by the end of it, I'm getting a little tired of not, not making sense. So that's my own opinion, and you can think about for your opinion. I don't really like abstract games that much for this reason. So now in my life, I'm looking for games that have a narrative experience that makes sense. So think about that. Think about whether you need that narr narrative experience or not, and use that as a guide to understand what sort of games that you might want to purchase. Until next time, I'm Scott Nicholson, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. of reviews this week. I think there's nine in total that you'll be seeing. I'm taking some kids to camp, so everything had to be pre-done this week, and so it's already been uploaded. But I can tell you that you'll see the new Marvel Legendary um, villains uh, that, that will be coming out this week, and the Heroes of Normandy from Yellow. You'll see that in several other reviews. Um, but it, I hope that last week made up for it. We posted 61 origin summer preview videos, all sorts of cool stuff. So go back and check those out. Lots of publishers and designers explaining and showing off their games that are coming out. So many cool little gem bits in there. If there's one I'd point out, I would say Kemble's Cascade. The, uh, that just looks really cool. Galaga as a board game. Uh, there's a top 10 list coming out this week. Top 10 educational games or games to use in the classroom. Maybe not so haha -ha funny this one, but hopefully one that would be useful, especially to those of you who work with middle school and high school. All right, well, that's what's coming out this week. Let's see another review. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Kickstarter has brought a wide variety of games to market with varying degrees of success. One standout is Dungeon Heroes from Gameland Games. Well, now they're dipping their toes into the app world and have brought Dungeon Heroes to iOS. Don't worry, they're bringing it to Android too. So, does this app belong in your collection? Let's take a quick look. A two-player roguelike game, Dungeon Heroes has one player as the Dungeon Lord constructing the most dangerous dungeon possible, while the other player manages the Dungeon Heroes that work as a team to reveal and conquer the terrors of the dungeon on their quest to collect treasures. Dungeon Heroes is a very literal port of the board game, which is kind of cool in this case because Gamelin seems to be specializing in creating unique meeples, and it's fun to play with those shapes even if it's just virtual. For solo play, they've created an arcade mode in which you pit yourself against an AI dungeon lord with a slight variation in rules. And let me tell you, it is brutally tough in both good and bad ways. The game is definitely challenging, which keeps you engaged, but there's also the frustration of losing quickly and constantly. It would be nice to see a difficulty option implemented in the future. Also, in solo play, you don't get to be the dungeon lord, and there's a ton of fun in planning out the tile placement with traps and monsters. For that, you can use the multiplayer pass and play or online feature. There, you play the true port of the board game, with one player placing the treasures, monsters, and traps through a passive and aggressive dungeon phase, while the other player navigates the dungeon square by square. For the first release of an app, Dungeon Heroes does well. There are a few nitpicks here and there. For example, the rules implementation is simply a digitized version of the rulebook from the game, which means some elements are irrelevant and there are no rules for the solo play game outside of the tutorial. But overall, the app maintains the spirit and fun of the physical game. There are two expansions out for Dungeon Heroes in real life, leaving room for app expansion in the future. For now, if you have a friend that'll play against you, or if you love trying to conquer extreme solo game challenges, Dungeon Heroes is worth a look. Give it a try. Hey, folks.
folks, Tom Vassell here. Jason Levine. And today our question comes from Tom V. Okay, this question is, why should I go to WBC? Now, <laughs> the WBC is the World Board Gaming Championships and it's a convention that happens in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, or it is in Lancaster? It's in Lancaster. It'll be coming up in a few weeks in the first week of August. Okay, so why would anyone want to go? It's a great experience. In my opinion, what I like about it the best is not so much the tournament atmosphere because there is there could be cutthroat players, but more the organized gaming of the tournament. So when you get there, you might see that Puerto Rico is going on on Thursday night at 7 at night, and you show up in this room, and there's 250 people all playing Puerto Rico at the same time. And you know that there's going to be copies of the game, and you can get into a game of it, and so you look, I always look at schedule and go, I like this game, I like this game, I like this game. And I could show up at that time and know that I could play the game I want to play. They also have great open gaming too. They actually have a huge open gaming library. So for those of you who have never been there who think it's just as competitive tournament, there is, I'd say, almost as much, much open gaming as there is tournament gaming there. Now, this is a, a convention. How, how, how big is it about? About... Oh, just under 2,000 people. Just under 2,000 people, and it's in a great area of the country. Like, there's a beautiful place to go visit. Someone who used to live there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, you, you mentioned the tournament structure. You said that don't be scared of it, but some people thrive on that. Then this is the place to go. These are some of the most yeah. well-run tournaments. Do you run tournaments there? Yes, I do. I actually run uh, three tournaments this year. I'm running Liar's Dice, which I run every year, which, for those of you who haven't played it, it's just a fun little... Uh, Bluffing game. It's from uh, Pirates of Caribbean 2. You can watch it there. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and I also uh, run a junior tournament, Igloo Pop, for the kids to just put little shakers in the ear. And this year, Rio Grande, they always add some new games to the mix. And this year, I volunteered to help out run their Concordia tournament as well. Oh, Concordia, which is up for the Kennedy Spiel. Yes, it is. Uh, it's awards. a great game. Great, That's the one he game. wants to win. <laughs> so, is there anybody that you would say should not come to WBC and they should look at a different way? I mean, is it for everybody, is my question. I think it is. I mean, even if you're not competitive, you can show up to tournaments, just play around, and have a fun time. A lot of people that go don't care about winning. Me, I don't care about winning too much. If I win, great. If I lose, hey, there's something else to do right after that. It's not the end of the world. It's also a fairly long convention. Yes, yes. If you do the whole thing like I do, it starts on a Saturday morning and runs all the way until the following Sunday. So you're talking nine days of gaming. But you don't need to go that long. No, the actual convention proper starts on Monday. So what they do on Saturday and Sunday is called the pre-con. And they do longer games during that. So you can play games like Through the Ages, like the full game. And you can play Age of Renaissance, some of the old old classic games you could do that on the first weekend because they figure well people want to play a whole bunch of little games during the week a lot of euro games that have become more popular but they keep the old standard long pads of glory is another one that gets played during the first weekend um so there's an eight all the 1830 games all the 18x games get played during the first weekend so if you're looking for any kind of longer game the first weekend's fun for that and then the rest of the convention you've got everything from Settlers, the Ticket to Ride, to Dominion, all the games that are popular are all there. Is there? Can you buy games there? Yes, yes. There's um, there's a whole dealers room. You get everyone from GMT, Z-Man. In fact, Robinson Crusoe was released there as the official release the year that it came out, and he did have copies. And they they actually sold out at the convention in like an hour, and then no one else could get copies for like another few months. Thanks a lot, Jason. <laughs> All right, well, if people want to find out more information about this, you can find it. Uh, just look up World Board Gaming Championships. If you guys have more questions for me and Jason, send them to Dicetower at gmail.com. Hello there. Chaz Marler here from the Pair of Dice Paradise Board Game Podcast with a question. Can board and card games form addictions? For example... I think it's a fair statement to say that customizable games, such as Marvel Dice Masters and Magic the Gathering, can have an addictive quality to them. 
the anticipation before opening a pack, wondering what treasures you'll discover inside, the rush of being rewarded with an exotic rare item, and even the smell of a freshly printed pack. Oh yes, the smell. Can the scent of a freshly cracked pack become habit forming? I have some background in publishing, so there's a thrill that I get from the bouquet of a freshly printed publication. And in the mid-90s, when I was introduced to Magic the Gathering, every pack offered the opportunity for odiferous inebriation. There is nothing that quite smells like a fresh pack of Magic the Gathering cards. Oh, paper cut. I never thought that anyone else shared in this olfactory oddity, until recently when my daughter, V-Bug, received a copy of Skip Bo Jr. as a gift. I was surprised to see that the very first thing that she did after opening it was to hold the deck up to her nose and deeply inhale its intoxicating aroma. So I couldn't help but wonder, did she learn it from me and is merely copying my behavior, or has she already learned to appreciate the aroma of a game's freshly opened accoutrements? Am I the only one with this obsession for nosing components? I'd be interested to know if anyone else out there shares this habit, or if you have any of your own habits or rituals that you perform when opening a new game. Let me know in the comments below. And in the meantime, I just scored a kilo of boosters just waiting to be nostril fodder. Ah, <sighs> Carta Monday, May 2013. That's a good vintage. Well, this is uh, coming out on the 23rd of June, and so we're almost halfway done with the year. And so I just wanted to take a look briefly at where we stand in the year 2014 at this point. Now, you can never judge, and I've stopped trying to judge a year based on the halfway point, because most of the great games of a year are released in the second half. I don't know why that is. It just is. Well, I, actually, I do know why that is, because Chen Con and Essen, the two big fairs that almost every big game is released at, are in the second half of the year. But so far, the first half of the year has been strong. We have seen board gaming just grow. Everyone I've talked to, the publishers at Origins, all told me we're just seeing a boom in the hobby. WizKids came out with the most popular game in years, um, uh, the uh, Marvel Dice Masters game that's been selling literally millions of dice, and then, which kind of astounds me that people go, I can't believe they're, they're deliberately keeping out of stock. No, they can't keep it in stock, folks. And that game, I think, will just continue to get bigger. We have seen a, a few games that have been released, a Ticket to Ride, Deluxe, and Chaos Ball, but many other games. But we still have some really big releases I think will come out. I really think from Cool Mini or not, I think Arcadia Quest is going to be a giant release. I think we're going to see several games where we're about to see the Munchkin craze hit with full blast with Loot Letter and uh, the Munchkin Panic. Um, we're going to see, uh, I, I've lost count of how many new games are coming out at Gen Con, but I believe it's up to 100 at this point, and Essen, of course, always has about five or 600 games. But all the publishers, like I said, we're seeing a growth in the industry. Now, I know some people worry, will this growth cause a big boom and a bust, and, and I, it might happen, but I... I think we're just seeing more and more families. I was so thrilled at Origins to see that the, the, there were so many uh, women and children there. Now, it wasn't just a bunch of middle-aged men going around. And, and we're seeing this just across the industry, and it's really exciting. What about Kickstarter and all this? Well, I think Kickstarter is still going strong as a whole. I think we're seeing uh, a lot of Kickstarter projects, but we're starting to see some companies get some backlash about not getting their games out on time. We're starting to see a lot more projects being funded, but we're not seeing these huge mega projects. There's a few here and there, but people are starting to get more wary. Companies that have a good track record, like Greater Than Games and uh, Stonemaier Games and uh, uh, Cool Mini or not, those companies, when they put something up, it, it, it funds instantly. But not everyone else is having that. And so while I'm sure Kickstarter, if they had a representative here, he would say, well, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, it is getting bigger, but I don't think Kickstarter is the huge bubble. I think the bubble has burst for many people, and, there's, and now people are becoming more and more cautious with what they back on Kickstarter. I don't think Kickstarter is going away or anything's happening to it, but I think we're going to see a leveling out over 2014. 
Uh, I predicted several things at the beginning of 2014. Some of those have come true. I said there would be a mega game, and I think I think it's safe to say that Dice Masters is that mega game. It's bigger than I had anticipated. Uh, I said that there would be a, a, a game brought back from the dead, a, a collectible card game, and Doomtown. I have a copy of it right here. Uh, hope to play that soon and see if that's any good or not. We're just, uh, the micro game craze, I, I said I thought was a fad, and, and I'm still not sure where that one is, but Love Letter has taken off. It's everywhere, almost to the point of nausea, I think. Uh, but hey, when you have a winner, I think you should run with it. We're seeing Asmodee and Z-Man explode with new releases. I'm really excited, folks. I really am. I, I cannot wait to Gen Con to see just the massive amount of games that are there and, and, uh, and Essen and see the massive amount of games that are there. There are so many. Now, this is somewhat problematic probably for the regular person who, and even for me, I mean, there's just thousands of games. How do you determine which ones are the best? So I hope that we at the Dice Tower can help you with that. Not make your choices for you, but show you all the stuff that's possible so that you can look at it and say, okay, I like this better than everything else. Oh, well. That's what I'm thinking about 2014. I think it's a very strong year so far, and I think it's going to end really well. I can't wait to see where it goes. All right, let's continue on. Hello there, my name is Mikhail. Welcome to another edition of Snake's Favorites. Do you like steampunk? I don't. But I love this game, Mission Red Planet. Mission Red Planet is an area control role selection game. In it, you are going to be sending colonists to Mars. Earth has developed spacefaring technology at the turn of the century, far, far earlier than we have now. Your colonists are represented by your little colored discs. You are going to be using different steampunk archetypes in order to get them to Mars and make sure that you have dominance over the particular regions of Mars. You're going to be hiring people such as the travel agent, the femme fatale, the scientist, and the explorer. You're going to be hiring these roles in order to push colonists onto the spaceships get the spaceships off of the ground and going to Mars. And then once they're on Mars, moving them around and making sure that they're safe and sound. However, your opponents can mess with you. They can blow up the ships you're on. They can force the ships to launch prematurely. They can use femme fatales to take out one of your pieces and replace it with one of their own pieces. Or they can just outright send pieces off the board into the Lost in Space Memorial. Great game. Um, it's about half an hour to an hour to play, which is fairly short for a area control game and just about the right time for a role selection game. Mission Red Planet is hugely popular in the cafe. We bust it out when we have a group of people who are looking for a game that's not too long yet provides a fair amount of bluffing, subterfuge, and strategic piece placement. Definitely a high recommend. Come in and play it next time you're in the cafe. And that's it for this week, folks. I'm already out of the area. Having taken kids for camp, I'll be out most of the week. If you have emails, I might get to those, but it's going to be sporadic and slow. But... Uh, like I said, next week we'll take it off because Dice Tower Con's coming. Keep your eyes open. The Dice Tower Awards are going to be announced soon. So I think that's going to be exciting. That They'll be announced at the Dice Tower Convention itself. Uh, most of the Kickstarter rewards have gone out. Once again, a big thank you from us to our Kickstarter backers. I'll see you guys in two weeks. I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.